Our next guest is the White House correspondent for PBS News, Howard. Please welcome to the show, Yamish Alcindor. How are you, Yamish? I'm doing well in this new life that we're living. We are actually used to, I should say, I'm used to seeing you uh, out. I'm used to seeing you at White House press conferences. It is nice to also see you inside. Um, how has this been, uh, going to White House press conferences during this situation? It's been incredibly, incredibly sobering. Um, this is, of course, a scary and wild time. So every day as I leave my house, I'm putting on a mask, I'm wiping my hands, and I'm also, of course, balancing the normal things that I do every day, which is making sure I know what questions I want to ask and what sources I want to check in with. So it just seems like there's this added level of seriousness and craziness to what was already a sort of crazy political time, I would say, in the last three years. Now, of course, one thing a journalist doesn't want to do is become part of the story. You've been put in an awkward situation where, as you've asked very fair questions that the president has framed as nasty, he's told you to be nice and to not be threatening. What is going through your mind in those moments where you realize you're part of the story as opposed to just getting the story? What's going through my mind is that I became a reporter because I think everyday people, vulnerable populations, deserve a voice, especially at the White House. So as the president maybe is lashing out at me and other reporters, the thing I keep thinking is, okay, but people need answers. We're in this time where people want to know, can I get a test? Am I going to be able to survive? How's my family going to do when we're losing our jobs? I think all of those things come to my mind. And I, in my own mind, think of myself as a civil rights reporter. So a lot of times I'm thinking about all the different people I've met over my career on the streets and on different stories and thinking they need answers. They want me to remain professional and focus on why I came to the White House today. You do, I wanna compliment you for the fact that you keep your poise in those moments. I don't believe I would be able to do so. Do you, when you get home, do you vent? Is, is there a time that you get out those moments? Well, I'm lucky because I got married about two years ago and I run home to this cute boy that lives <laughs> with me and I decompress with my husband. I talk about my day, but I also do things like listen to Bill Weathers on repeat and remember that there are so many better days ahead of us and that everyone should kind of decompress and, and calm down. So I personally really take the time to dance around my apartment and to just talk to my husband. And that's the way that I've had to, that's the way I've been able to weather all of this. I think a, a lot of us have found uh, that we're lucky to have uh, families in times like this to, to create a, a cushion from the moment we're going through. Um, can you just speak, you know, because obviously you've been covering the story uh, like your colleagues from the beginning. Can you speak to what you believe the root causes are for or not just how this started? Uh, and no one thinks it's the Trump administration's uh, fault that, you know, uh, this virus exists, but uh, their failures to sort of uh, deal with it, what the root causes of that were. I think there were two really big things going on. The first is that the president, um, before this coronavirus outbreak, he was making government smaller in his mind. And in that regard, he disbanded the National Security Council's office that deals with pandemics. He also really pared down the CDC's um, staff. So there was a, a, a one moment where the or one thought that the president was really um, making sure that the government was too small and was smaller in his mind. The other thing that was going on, though, that was President Trump was downplaying the virus. He was telling reporters like me and signaling to Americans all over the country um, that this was something that wasn't that serious, that it was gonna be gone by April, that this was gonna be some sort of miracle that was gonna just be washed away. And because of that, you had those two things come together and now that's why you have a lot of people criticizing the president's response because one, they didn't seem to be ready for a pandemic, and two, the president, once a pandemic was on his doorstep, um, was downplaying it, thinking really about his political future in a lot of regards and thinking about being reelected re as president. One of the strange things that we've seen as these press conferences get longer is you have a situation not just that the president will contradict himself day to day, he sometimes will contradict himself within the body of an hour-long press conference. Is it refreshing then to have someone like Dr. Anthony Fauci on the dais who's a bit more consistent? And is it true that you have spoken to him directly through this? I have spoken to Anthony Fauci directly. Um, there was a day where there was some stories about him being excluded from the White House briefing. So I contacted his office and he actually called me back which was pretty surprising. And the first time he called me back, I didn't pick up the phone because I thought he was literally a prankster. And then I eventually called him back. And of course his voice is very, very distinct. So I knew it was him, but he was stressing to me that his relationship with the president is really good and that he's focused on doing the work of the people. I think it's refreshing in, in some people's minds to of course have 
scientists who are experts to talk about this. There is, of course, the fact that the president constantly contradicts himself. And that's why as a reporter, I often ask the president, look, you said this, but you are now saying this. How do you square that? The president sometimes gets mad at that. But I think it's doing a service to people to be able to point out every single day as, as much as we possibly can that the president often not only shares misleading information, but contradicts himself sometimes within minutes. You mentioned you're a, a civil rights reporter. Uh, that's where you began. These are the sort of stories you cover. We've been seeing more and more uh, in recent weeks that this is uh, disproportionately affecting minority communities. Is there, do you have any optimism or any sense that there's a plan within the White House to address that? As of now, they're signaling that they don't have a plan, but it's also because they don't actually have the data to even create a plan. Lawmakers have been pushing for federal data to be collected and then shared when it comes to looking at the racial disparities. We know that Black people in most cities and states around the country are dying because they have more underlying conditions like asthma um, and diabetes. And part of that is systemic racism and the conditions that African Americans often live in this country. But I think that there isn't at this point of, of a particular plan. Aunt, Dr. Anthony Fauci talked about this and he said they're collecting the, the data and once they have information to share, they'll be able to share more about that.